Hello, everybody. I'm very excited to welcome all of you in this first LinkedIn Live Innovation in Medical Education. Um, I will introduce myself very shortly, and I'm very excited to go to the rest of our panels to introduce themselves. So my name is Diana, and I am a medical doctor in the Netherlands, and I work in pediatrics, um, about to finish my PhD as well. And uh, today I'm very excited to talk about this topic. I've been actually uh, a synchronized swimmer in the national team. And in that I saw the value of mentorship. And I think that that is the same for education. And that's actually what binds me very much to be very eager uh, to provide good education. And with that being said, I would like to ask um, Dr. Hansa Bergava to introduce herself and tell us what actually binds her to the education part and also the innovation part. Thank you so much, Diana, and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I'm Hansa Vargava. I am a pediatrician and chief medical officer of Medscape Education, as well as senior medical director over at WebMD. I'm, a I'm also staff at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. So I think that education is essential uh, for two reasons. One is to raise awareness and, you know, continuously raise awareness about issues that matter. And I hope that we talk about some of those issues. And also it's really important for, uh, to, to make sure that the future of medicine is secure with education for our, our younger doctors, our medical students, as well as you know, our upcoming nurses, clinicians, and, you know, other providers. So I'm very, to be here and thank you. Thank you so much and I'm very uh, eager to hear your views on this with all of your experience and I would like to uh, tell the people that are watching this live on the LinkedIn there is a section where you can comment so if you have a question uh, please comment it uh, and we will address it uh, but with that being said I would like to give the microphone uh, to Jonathan uh, to Dr. Jonathan Bringas Dimitriades to introduce himself and tell us what his affiliation is with the education and mostly the innovation part. Thank you Diana thank you very much uh, for for inviting me here in the Medscape of course uh, this is a great uh, initiative uh, my name is Jonathan Bringas. I'm a medical doctor from Peru. I'm currently living in the Netherlands and I work as a doctor, innovator, and entrepreneur, um, uh, chief medical communications officer of medtech uh, technology company uh, in uh, Finland, Nukuta, and co-founder of Lapsi Health, which is a DTX company in the Netherlands. And I'm an eager and passionate um, advocate for education and for medical education, and of course, for the adoption of technology uh, from uh, the providers of healthcare in different countries in Latin America. Uh, for me, the biggest uh, motivation uh, in terms of education and, and advocacy is delivering the right uh, amount and the high quality education that Latin American doctors uh, deserve to have so that we can also prosper as the rest of the world in technologies uh, and giving access to our populations. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And when you say that, I already have a lot of questions to ask you, so I'm eager to start. But before we're going to do that, we're going to continue to uh, introduce our panel. Um, and with that, if you are watching this, you can uh, like uh, it and share it so other people can also join in and listen to this panel discussion and ask their questions if uh, they have questions uh, or comments. Um, with that being said, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Vinette Aurora to tell us who she is and also what is her plight and where her passion for the education and also innovation comes from. Sure, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Vinny Aurora. I am here as a hospitalist at the University of Chicago in the south side of Chicago. I am just over a month into a new position as Dean for Medical Education here at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine, where I oversee medical education for students, residents, fellows, as well as faculty in continuing medical education. Uh, so in addition to living and breathing medical education, my passion for really thinking about education and innovation uh, comes from the need to really um, skate to where the puck is and create um, health professionals who are going to meet the needs of um, the world really in the future. And how we do that and the, the way we do that is really one of the most important things we can consider in the health profession. So thanks, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Um, and I am, already have some questions for you as well. And I think 
people that are watching might have as well because you have so much experience in this. Um, so we would, I would like to continue. Uh, maybe right now, Dr. Rafael Grossman would like to introduce himself and tell us, because Rafael, Dr. Rafael, you did some amazing things with the innovation and also education part. Uh, <laughs> can you introduce yourself and tell us what, uh, what binds you so much to the education and innovation? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Diana. And thank you for, for the invitation to be here with, with such a great uh, group of uh, innovators and, and, uh, and uh, game changers. Um, I'm originally from Venezuela, uh, from Caracas, that's a flat, and uh, I trained in the U.S. Uh, after med school in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in, in surgery. And uh, since then, I, I've been uh, living in the U.S., uh, mostly in Maine, until about a couple months ago. Uh, for, for me, I, I'm a general and a trauma surgeon, but I also uh, get into advanced laparoscopy and robotic surgery. I think that use a lot of technology in order to, to, to be able to function. Uh, for me, uh, uh, in addition to medicine, my passion is technology and how to, how to use technology in a smart way in order to, to augment, to enhance what we do in healthcare. And I always say healthcare uh, is all about uh, connectivity and communication, which brings us to education. I think that uh, technology used in a smart way, especially in uh, today's age, uh, 21st century, we have such an amazing potential to use the tools that we have available, tools that were created maybe for playing and for entertainment. We can use those tools to uh, enhance the reach of uh, our knowledge to uh, anywhere in the world, to make uh, healthcare and any other discipline in human endeavor, but especially healthcare, make it more uh, equitable, more accessible, uh, you know, from Latin America to Africa to Asia, to rural areas in the US and many other places in the world. I think that we have the tool to enhance how we educate, how we instruct, how we guide, how we teach and how we learn. So uh, it is really exciting uh, to be here uh, because uh, I know that uh, the perspective that you are going to bring to this uh, talk is, is going to be it's certainly fantastic. It's really, really a pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you so much. And your innov uh, innovation ideas are amazing. And I think for that, you really have to think outside of the box. And that's exactly what you do. Uh, so I'm very curious yeah. about your thoughts that you're going to share with us. Uh, with that being said, I would like to uh, ask our last panelist to introduce herself. Dr. Tiffany Love, could you uh, unmute yourself and tell us who you are and what you do with education and what it brings your passion to this uh, panel discussion today? Yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tiffany Love. My clinical background as, is as a nurse practitioner. I also have a PhD in healthcare research and I'm a board certified healthcare executive. I have served as a chief nursing officer and chief operating officer in many organizations around the country. And I'm currently with the University of Vermont Healthcare System at Porter Medical Center. My passion is developing healthcare leaders, serving uh, in my role as a mentor and faculty through the Harvard Medical CME for Women in Healthcare Leadership, Sigma Theta Tau International Society for Nurses, and through the American College of Healthcare Executives. And it's my vision for my career to work with academic institutions to develop the future leaders of our healthcare organizations using innovation and technology to really develop the pipeline of leaders that we need to meet the demands of the adaptive uh, challenges that we face every day in healthcare leadership. Thank you. Extremely important. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that is very pivotal in having good education is to have great leadership. Uh, and I'm very curious of, uh, of, uh, of, of the discussion further and your input uh, from that view. Um, and with that uh, said, I would like to ask actually, actually the first question to Dr. Binet about uh, the landscape of healthcare, because it has been changing a lot right now. Uh, what are the changes that you have been seeing and um, how do you see the postgrad and the continuous medical education uh, changing with these uh, these changes in, in the healthcare system right now? Thank you, Diana, for that question. Um, I definitely think we've seen a burning platform for change, uh, particularly around um, health professions education broadly. And um, I'd like to thank you for specifically calling out changes needed in postgraduate, um, graduate, as well as continuing medical education. And just so we're on the same page, some of those issues that are really, um, you know, 
creating that sense of urgency for many of us in health professions, education, not only include the pandemic and the upheaval of all of medical care, um, the move to telemedicine, but also the really deep, uh, you know, rooted problems related to um, racial injustice and health inequity that that have come to the forefront. They've always been there, but now they're really staring us at the face and challenging us to do a better job, as well as all of the amazing things in technology that many of I, my colleagues here are doing um, around artificial intelligence and machine learning. The future um, healthcare workforce is going to be using computers and doing that work alongside computers, and how do we do that well? Um, and so when I think about this, particularly particularly with respect to continuing medical education. What's important is that when you're uh, finishing your graduate medical education, resident fellowship, whatever it is, taking your first job, your learning is not done. In fact, your learning is just beginning. Um, oftentimes uh, in adult learning theory, we talk about learning cycles and you know we know burnout is, is rampant. When we stop learning, we get stagnant. And that is actually uh, one of the challenges with, with burnout. And so when you think about the beginning of the COVID pandemic, people were, you know, looking for information, learning from each other. Um, how do we really catapult that and keep that, you know, zest for learning um, while we also have to deal with the very real issues of compassion fatigue that are currently occurring in our workforce? Um, these issues that happen to be acutely dealing, that we're dealing with with the pandemic, they're just actually magnifying what we always knew was going to happen, which is we're going to be facing health professions short shortage, workforce, geographic maldistribution. How do we not tell people to work harder, but teach them and train them, but also design systems to work smarter? That's going to have to come from not just within our workforce, but we're going to need um, a lot of minds outside of our workforce to help us. And so I think all of those really create a mindset of learning as opposed to learned helplessness, which is what I see my colleagues struggling with right now um, due to the, the current um, issues that they're facing. Um, and that's something that I think we really need to move to as a culture of learning. That's very interesting. And I'm, I'm actually wondering what your thoughts are on uh, the digital health in this, that it, do you think it's gonna be helpful to, to steer this in the right direction, uh, the innovation part, or what are your thoughts on this? Because I, th I think what I've heard is that also some people are a little bit weary of it because they think that it actually will be more of a burden. Um, could you yeah. could you fill me on? And yeah, I'll tell you what I think, and I'd be curious what my colleagues think, especially those that are in that space. I I will say um, for a lot of people on the front line, digital health is the shiny new thing, right? And people are always excited about the new thing, or you know. Uh, but if it doesn't fit into your work day and it makes it harder, and there's more logins, and you know it doesn't work, it's actually. Uh, just going to sit there and gather dust. And so how is it that we actually think about the human-centered design and workflow to respect workflow and integrate it? How can technology make your life easier, um, particularly in healthcare? We see um, user-centered design applied a lot outside of healthcare. Um, it's time to bring that to electronic health records and documentation and all of the other things so that our clinicians can feel well, but also provide state-of-the-art healthcare. Thank you so much. And I, I saw Dr. Raphael, he's nodding very much. Uh, I'm wondering if he has something to add to it or maybe some of our other panelists that have uh, ideas on this. Absolutely. I just couldn't agree more. I think that it's so uh, um, comfortable and comforting uh, to hear uh, those words. Uh, to me, you know, digital, digital health to me is, 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 is health. I mean, when we talk about healthcare, for me, telehealth or digital health is really all part of healthcare in the 21st century. And it's all about using the technology in a smart way in order to allow us to connect and communicate better and to, to, to make the dynamic, the flow of our work better, and especially to rescue that a relationship between the physician, the provider, the nurse, and the patient, because we have lost that completely in the last two or three decades because of the use of the technology in an in appropriate way. Uh, uh, when, when, when you look at EMRs, electronic medical records, right, electronic health records, and, and you see how have they separated us from our patients and how uh, the, the, the last uh, and this current generation of providers 
uh, is suffering tremendous amount of, of uh, mental health issues of, of the so-called burnout, mainly and in great deal of, uh, because of, of, of the, the bad application of technology, I think that it's so, so important to preach that, that it, it's not the technology, it's bad technology or the bad application of technology. When you have a, a apps or, or, or platforms or algorithms that make your life easier, but not just your, your life easier, but that connects and, and, and lets you communicate better with the digital record, with the, with the facts, with your patient. And instead of being in front of a computer 80% of the time, you can be in front of a patient 80% of the time and rescue that, that sort of empathetic relationship, which is what medicine is all about. That's why we all went into medicine that has been almost completely lost. And what you said about compassion fatigue is like my, 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 my favorite hashtag, compassion fatigue. You know, people go to work, most people in healthcare, I think, go to work, they try to go through as fast as they can so they don't have to stay two or three hours uh, 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 after hours doing documentation and billing, and, and they don't even think about, you know, that patient, that family, that relative who's there, you know, suffering that has ha given you the rights and the privilege to be able to treat them. But we, we forget about that sometimes because we have to go through the million, you know, clicks and queries and whatnot. So it is all about the smart use of the technology to rescue that, that humane side of medicine and make medicine what it should be in the 21st century. Yes, indeed. And I think this is what you talked about while you were introducing yourself, uh, using it as a tool that uh, will help you actually. Um, I was wondering, because I think that uh, our Jonathan, you also have something to fill in on this. Uh, go ahead. Yes. So first of all, I can agree more with uh, Raphael and Vinit. It's uh, really refreshing to hear your thoughts. Um, you know, I always uh, get asked, why uh, is there... Um, such a feeling against technology from the providers. And I think that there's a stigma and the stigma is generated by inefficient tools, uh, inefficient tools that have been imp implemented in healthcare for a long time. And um, what we have to do actually, and I was saying it in a panel a couple of weeks ago, is that we need to create technology that makes exactly the opposite. And that makes it so efficient that the doctors can have more time with their patients, that the, the, the doctor-patient relationship can actually be a fulfilling relationship that is valued by the doctor, but also by the patient. Because it's, it has such an impact in the patient journey. Um, and, and it actually has even healing, uh, a sort of healing power, you know, just having the right doctor, trusting your doctor that they are doing the right decision for you and having that fluent communication. So um, I think that technologies will continue to deliver uh, better and more efficient care as we start to create, just as Vinita and I love that term, human-centered design in our technology. Thank you so much. And I was actually wondering, because uh, Tiffany, you are you spoke already about leadership, and I think it's very mm -hmm. important to have great models to implement these new things and to guide them correctly. Um, and that also has an organizational uh, aspect towards it. What are your thoughts on this? Yes, so let me just say that in the executive leadership level, we understand the huge impact of rolling out an electronic health record. Even if you already have one, rolling out a new one, having providers having to learn a new set of skills is very impactful. There are organizations that set up incident command, which is our disaster command structure, when we know that we're rolling out these electronic health records because we know that there are some physicians who are mentally prepared to retire or to leave the organization if they cannot adjust to this new process. And so I agree with all of the speakers. We really need to have an electronic health record that is so efficient, that is so helpful, that it really is tailored to the needs of the user and not just us adjusting to the needs of the, or the requirements of the electronic health record. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I completely agree with you. And I see that we have one of uh, the people that are viewing, they ha uh, has a question, which I would uh, be willing to, uh, or happy to read. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Raphael already um, uh, mentioned it a little bit, but I was wondering if uh, uh, Dr. Hansa can maybe uh, answer this question, maybe more into detail. Because um, uh, Abid Alal is asking, how can I AI be established to revitalize uh, and sustain humanism rather than becoming another tool for billing and sacrificing the doctor-patient relationship. Dr. Hansa, could you uh, give an answer to this uh, question? Look, I think that, uh, first of all, artificial intelligence is 
really a, another way of quickly analyzing and coming up with predictions. That's probably the simplest way to explain artificial intelligence. And the way it can actually impact our hospital systems and our healthcare is to actually help outcomes data quicker. It can actually help in the emergency room, predicting uh, what patient might need to be hospitalized, what patient may need to be in critical care unit, what patient could go home. And you know, there's so many other applications with early diagnosis of autism, for example, or what they're using at uh, Ready Children's with whole genome sequ sequencing um, and at AI to actually elevate uh, earlier diagnosis of infant, infants who have seizures. So there's just so many applications of AI uh, that can actually really help us um, be better clinicians. But I do agree that um, it's to help us be more human. And the way I see this is to actually, because it increases our efficiency, because it can actually help us guide care, actually help us have more time with the patient as well. And have AI as an assistant type of, in an assistant type of role, as opposed to something that you're worried about taking over your practice is probably a better way to look at it. Lastly, I do think the burnout issue is just really, really important. And so I think going back to what one of my colleagues said, you know, we went into medicine to provide compassion care for our patients. We've not been able to do that because, you know, as surveys show, we're spending 200 minutes a day on admin. And to that point, I think AI could help us get there. However, I will also point to the EMR trajectory where we knew it was coming as clinicians, but we weren't at the table. And so now we are not, we are outside of that world and trying to uh, retroactively make it user friendly. Let's get at the table with these digital innovations, these digital therapeutics with AI. Let's be at the table as clinicians so we can help guide how it can integrate into our systems more effectively. Thank you so much. I um, I love the way you you explain this uh, and and uh, I, I it was amazing. And uh, I was in the meantime I was also reading some more. We have some more questions from the viewers. Um, I do want to because we uh, we are keeping ourselves on an hour. I want to continue uh, in a bit with the next questions because we still have a few more questions. Um, uh, and I'm looking very quickly through the the question, and I think there's one more question mainly about the human centric design by uh, Susan Smith uh, for patients that um, they have to fill out multiple handwritten forms um, and have redundant questions before seeing the provider. Um, and then they are asked the same questions again. I think we can all relate to this um, and how we could improve this. I don't know if one of our panelists would have uh, some thoughts on this. I'd love to, if possible. I, I really think that, that this human-centered design in healthcare, uh, we cannot just think about the provider, you know, the physician or, or the nurse and the physician or, or all the other providers. It's about the whole team. You know, the, the human-centered design of healthcare is to affect positively and improve the experience, enhance and facilitate the experience of everyone, starting with the patients. We all would agree that the experience today, especially in the US, which is where I have been working for most of my life, it's absolutely terrible in most places. There are exceptions, but in most places, because the design is, is, is completely a flaw. It's not centered on the actual person from the perspective of that person. Uh, there's no empathy in the design of a lot of the stuff that we do in order to allow us to do healthcare today. And that is a big problem. Patients are the cornerstone and it has to start all with the patients. And AI can really help there. If we use AI algorithms in order to improve that flow and select the right questions of the right uh, uh, physicians or providers or nurses who are going to see you and, and, and sort of tailor and make that experience one where you maybe won't have more time with the patient, but you have better quality time with the patient. And instead of spending 80% of that small amount of time that you have with the patient, repeating and re, uh, doing redundant things, with the, you can really focus on what's important and have a lot of extra time in order to engage on that, on that humane connection with a particular human being. So I think that that's very, very important. 
Thank you on uh, answering that question, because I think that is very important. I think that uh, we all encounter that very often. Uh, so I think uh, I think Susan, it was uh, for asking uh, asking that question because we're almost uh, at or we are already at 26 minutes. I would like to continue to the next question. And my next question was actually for uh, Tiffany. Uh, and my question was, how can we ensure that equity is also included in all healthcare education, also for physicians and for nurses? Um, can you answer uh, us and uh, from there on? Absolutely. So I do feel that academia has increasingly improved ed educating clinicians on how to identify inequity within the populations they serve, but there is still room to improve. So for academic institutions who want to improve their educational offerings, uh, they can refer to uh, one of the new reports specifically around nursing. It's from the National Academy of Medicine. It's called The Future of Nursing 2020 to 2030, charting a, charting a Path to Health Equity. And this is a roadmap for nurse educators and particularly recommendation number seven talks about how programs should ensure nurses are prepared to address social determinants of health to achieve health equity. Sounds like a simple ask, but of course it is not. And you know, the first thing I think about is, okay, so we need to establish what does it mean to be competent in, in doing this work? And, and of course we cannot accomplish it through just one course, we must integrate it throughout the curriculum. And for physicians, one example is the American Academy of Family Physicians has a health equity curricular toolkit. And so we do have national organizations who have put together these toolkits for us to help guide our uh, better improving our curriculum for future clinicians. Now, I would actually recommend us taking a slightly different approach. While it's very important to train and educate our clinicians, it's important to also train healthcare leaders who are the decision makers and the gatekeepers on how we can implement these changes at an organizational level. And also is the, the healthcare leaders in the organization who can empower the clinicians to speak up when they identify a problem with a process or a lack of a process to intervene in addressing identify social determinants of health. And I am in the process of developing a leadership program that will have a special emphasis on training nurse leaders on how to identify and address health inequity within their organization based on the recommendations of this roadmap with the leaders from um, the National Academy of Medicine. So thank you. That is really amazing because I think that is really something that will make a very, very big difference. And I see everybody's nodding with me that they agree. Uh, uh, with uh, with what you just said, Tiffany, thank you so much. Um, I see that we have a question. Maybe Tiffany, you could uh, answer this one. Um, it comes from Francile Alves, if I pronounce it correctly. And by the way, I love everybody giving their comments and their questions. It's very nice to be interactive. Um, so please continue doing that. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can uh, obviously also comment on the YouTube video and we'll try to get back to you with our uh, answers. So the question from Francile is if you could maybe comment your, uh, your opinion on how we could improve healthcare professional experience and learning process nowadays. Oh, so again, I feel like we do not use technology in the best way that we could. Uh, one example is just very simple educational offerings that we have, like getting your ACLS and VLS. I worked at organizations where you can kind of quickly do it on the computer, you do your little mega code, and then you go practice it in a simulation lab with a mannequin. Uh, many organizations, especially in rural healthcare, don't have the funding or just don't have the technology available at their hands. And we very much are thoughtful about the fact that we have a lot of clinicians who are leaving healthcare, especially in 2020. That was a hard year, especially with regard to nursing. That was the largest number of nurses that have retired in the history of our country, right? So if people are leaving healthcare at such a rapid pace, we need to be rapidly producing more clinicians, more nurses, more physicians, more advanced practice providers. And a wonderful way we can do that is through technology. Why would we have someone go and sit in a classroom when they potentially can do a lot of innovative education from their home? 
you know, we understand people are, they have children, they have families to take care of. They want to pursue and advance their education, but they don't have time to sit in the classroom. So I would encourage our academic institutions to think more globally about how can we provide the same quality of education, but from the comfort of someone's home or their own computer. Thank you so much. And I was wondering, uh, Dr. Hansa, if you could maybe uh, um, put your perspective on this, on uh, the different types of contents uh, or uh, to access of, uh, for the access of education, if you could fill us in on, the, on that from your point of perspective. Um, idea that it doesn't have to be in a classroom. Yes, absolutely, it doesn't have to be in a classroom. And uh, we have ways to actually use our digital footprints. That means like the access we have to hundreds of th and thousands of users, whether it's via Medscape, whether it's through the University of Chicago, whatever the platform may be. But there's also different types of content that actually appeal to different learners. And that might be that I wanna read an article or I wanna hear a podcast or I wanna participate in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, interaction. I think that we can actually use that. We know that 75% of clinicians are gonna be digital natives in the next five years. And you know, that means that we actually have to use those online tools anyways. And it also speaks to the, the work-life balance. People can't constantly be in classrooms when they have a family at home. And also we need to think about that perspective from the perspective of burnout. So in order to help clinicians learn, but also have their work-life family balance, we can actually point to all these types of different types of education that we have access to. And lastly, there is a possibility of connection. We know that we're going to social media more clinicians on social media platforms more and more for that connection. So why not use those platforms to also have a way to educate and increase awareness about innovation or anything else? Thank you so much. I really think indeed that there's a shift uh, in that, that we can use more platforms nowadays. And that's very interesting because it opens a lot of doors, but it does uh, uh, make have it makes us think differently, I think. We need to stay focused on how we can uh, provide this. Uh, and I was actually wondering, uh, Dr. Vinette, if you could um, talk about your perspective um, on the students, on um, on how you, you have experienced this. Absolutely, thank you. I, um, you know, I did want to just say uh, that we have a valuable resource among us, which is we have what's called zero gravity thinkers, people who are not, uh, you know, uh, encumbered by the way it was. Uh, and so people who actually have an eye for innovation um, are coming into our, our profession wanting to see change, and they're not coming as blank slates. Many of them have had careers in the past, um, or they've actually uh, had learning in higher ed that is actually more active, more problem-based, um, that they can bring those experiences and we can learn from them. And so one of the things we need to do in, in medicine, uh, particularly um, in healthcare, where we have steep hierarchies, is to have humility, to say we can learn from people who do not have titles and who actually can teach us. And so, you know, especially when we think about technology, some of the people who got the best tips are actually not the people at the top, but they're the people that are working day in, day out with patients with the electronic health record, a resident or a medical student. Um, and so similarly, around issues of equity and work-life balance, I have been so impressed by um, you know, the moral compass of our medical students and our health profession students coming into this field, um, especially inspired by the pandemic and um, some of the issues around um, social justice that have actually inspired them to enter our field. So I, that is what gives me hope. I have a lot of hope for the future. Um, and our goal should be to not um, take that joy away from them. And so that's something actually I think we need to spend some time. That's why the burnout issue is so important, uh, because people come in for the right reasons and they have a lot of assets that they can bring to the table. And how can we let those voices flourish is really our, our uh, the question that we need to answer so that we can achieve the end that we want to achieve. That's that's very nice. I, I agree. I think um, we have been in this traditional way of healthcare already for a long time, uh, and it, it it takes some um, some some focus and I think efforts to to let go a little bit of this traditional way of thinking. And uh, as you said, to listen to these new innovative ideas. And I know that uh, Dr. Rafael he also has had many 
uh, innovative ideas, especially in education. Maybe you can uh, comment us a little bit on what you did and what your perspective is on this. Yes, thank you, Diana. <clears throat> for, for me, really, uh, like I said before, it's about the smart use of technology. So back in 2010, I think when the iPod Touch came out, uh, we used that device that was created to play music. Uh, we used that device to do a telehealth, a trauma, acute trauma consultations in rural Maine. Uh, then uh, about seven years ago, the Google Glass came out. I was the first doctor to ever use Google Glass to stream what I was seeing to a group of students nearby Rather than being behind me trying to learn and see what I was doing, they were sitting sipping coffee in the next room. Uh, after that, you know, we had a, an evolution of the device, right? From from smart glasses that now include uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, or what we call mixed reality, to the use of haptics in virtual reality, to the things that a, a Level X, for example, is doing with. A, a procedural training platforms on, on any smartphone that anyone carries in their pockets in order to democratize how we access medical education and again, how we connect and how we communicate. Uh, there's a platform called Fundamental VR and uh, disclosing I'm one of their advisors. And there are other platforms that do a, a surgical a, a, a teaching in virtual reality. What Fundamental VR is doing is uh, adapting haptics, the sensation of touch in VR. So you put an Oculus Quest device or similar and you're in the operating room and you're practicing just like the pilots practice, you know, flying a, a 747. You know, you can practice in the OR before you even touch a human patient, but also not, not just immerse in that virtual reality experience, but you are feeling every sense, every shaking of the drill and every, you know, a, 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 a knock on the hammer. A, that's what I, that's what really what, what, what fires me up, you know, using the technology in a smart way in order to improve how we learn, how we teach, how we access people. Like we can have this seminar right now and uh, we can have people in the middle of the Pacific. If they have Wi-Fi, they'll be watching what we're saying and they're learning and we might be learning from them as well. So there's no limit to what we can do. And I think that uh, like they, uh, one of my colleagues was saying, yeah, we have the, the zero gravity, you know, generation where, where this is what they grow up with. They, there's no, I mean, they use TikTok to communicate and Instagram. We need to use those tools in order to improve how we connect and how we teach and how we learn. And there's no question about that. Thank you so much. And I, whenever you talk, you, you can hear your passion in your voice and you start talking more passionate and more passionate. And you just fire this up, I think, in everybody. I don't think you, do, you have that effect. It's amazing, Dr. Raphael. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking, we already have also some more questions. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll have the time to address all the questions of all our, our viewers, but we're going to make a big effort to do so. Um, and I think we have one question from uh, Tifu uh, Amba, which I would like to address, but uh, maybe change the question a little bit uh, towards, um, uh, let's say, what um, the what the the burnout and the work life balance, what the impact is on education, uh, because I think um, uh, Tifu Amba is also asking about. Uh, it's great that we have all this digital education, but if it's not tied to compensation, uh, that the, the fear is there that people won't do it. Um, I think this is a little bit the question that also it interferes a little bit with your work um, uh, life uh, and uh, balance. And uh, I would, was wondering if uh, Dr. Hansa, if you could uh, comment on this. Question, it's such an important question. So, you know, it's interesting. We look at the landscape of medicine. We know there's all these changes coming, whether it's innovations and in digital therapeutics or whether it's, you know, the need to identify equity and make sure that everyone has access to care. So there's all these moving targets that we as clinicians are asked to identify. And then, of course, there's the overlay of the pandemic. And going into this entire equation over the last few years, almost 50% of clinicians were burnt out. And now, of course, that's magnified. So, you know, how do we get beyond that? Now I have one more thing to do. I have to, you know, learn about the, the digital therapeutics. I have to learn about AI. I have to make sure that I'm, I'm being an equitable clinician. And, you know, I have to take care of my work home family. So I would say to you that this is where in education, it would be really important to acknowledge that this is a huge issue because if we don't identify that burnout is an issue and we don't help with that, there is no way, and I, you know, this is just my opinion, but from the data that I've seen, 
it is going to be very hard ultimately to authentically move forward and ask our clinicians to do all these other things in addition to what they're barely being able to do. So I would advocate that in education, whether it's undergrad, postgrad, digital, however it is, we teach our clinicians to take care of themselves because you cannot pour from a cup that is empty. And we're asking them to do all these extra things and how can they do it unless we actually give them that space to actually take care of themselves. And lastly, go, um, going through training in a very traditional medical school environment, which was the University of Toronto for me um, and the Hospital of Sick Children, which was very, very stressful also. Um, and I loved every moment of it, don't get me wrong, but the culture of medicine has to shift as well. And I think Vinny, um, you alluded to this a little bit and you know, you're seeing those undergraduate students, the medical students that you're seeing, but we have to shift our culture to look at everyone in the room, whether it's a patient, a nurse, a doctor, you know, or the person who is cleaning the room and saying to knowing that they are just like us, to have that respect and know that everyone brings something to the table. So taking care of ourselves and looking at each other with compassion are essential for us to get through this list of extra things that we need to do as clinicians. I completely agree and thank you so much. And uh, Vinny, do you have something else to add to this? Because I can imagine that you, you might have. Yeah, I uh, thank you. And a shout out to Tiffa, who's one of our few former um, um, University of Chicago staff members and a mentee. I, um, I did want to say that there's only so much we can do in, in health professions education. We need policy. We need payment reform. And we've got to shift the payment reform uh, to focus on what matters. You know, we have to reward what matters. And what matters is taking care of patients and also taking care of clinicians. And unfortunately, the way that we've um, used our our payment system right now is to reward um, volume over value. And so we have a lot of work to do outside of health professions education, but we can be part of the solution by um, being at the table, by convening with policymakers, uh, by advocating. Those are not things that are uh, you know, dirty words in health professions education. I think these are reasons we need to be at the table. Thank you so much. And again, also, thank you so much for all the people that are live here with us that are asking their questions. If uh, And if you're watching this on YouTube later on, you can also comment uh, uh, the YouTube video and ask your questions. We'll try to get back to you uh, with answers. Uh, but I love the interaction that we're having. And I'm sorry that we might not be able to address all the questions that we're having, but it just shows us that we are hitting a topic that is very much uh, needed to be hit uh, and uh, spoken about. And I love the, our uh, all expertise panelists uh, that are here today on Medscape uh, to, to give their light on, on their uh, point of view on this. Um, so thank you for that. Um, but I would like to uh, also go to our next question. <laughs> uh, and my next question is for, for Hansa because um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on how we can make all the healthcare workers aware of the impact of the innovation and health, such as AI, but also the whole digital transformation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I, I do think uh, what I said before is really important, Diana, and that is that, you know, I, I point to the EMR uh, history that we've had as clinicians and, you know, how difficult that has been to transition. And I really encourage uh, fellow clinicians to come to the table and educate yourselves and be aware of all the changes that are happening with digital, with artificial intelligence, with wearables. It is already happening. It's all pervasive. Hospitals are leaning on it. I read a recent article from Seattle Children's and how they were able to use artificial intelligence to actually um, decrease the use of opioids in surgery. They're not using opioids in surgery anymore. Um, and that was with, with the help of artificial intelligence to look at patterns and predict behavior. Uh, there's another um, digital therapeutic that's coming out of the West Coast that is going to be able to help diagnosis of autism to lessen the delay in diagnosis for autism, which is a huge issue for so many families. So I would encourage our clinicians to absolutely engage in this. And you know, I know that the curriculums and the schools are changing in terms of their culture to help our clinicians um, to address their burnout. So, you know, that's happening simultaneously. Embrace that these issues are just really important. They're coming 
I don't want to um, have us run over um, and kind of not know what's going on. So the best way to do that is just take the bull by the horns and you know, go into education, learn all you can about this and be a part of it. Come to the table, come to the table. Thank you so much. And with that, I would like to address also the question that Abi Dalal is, uh, is uh, pointing out and maybe Hansa, you can comment it on it. Um, what do you think about uh, platforms for mental health uh, destigmatization? Because I think that is also a big one um, uh, to address. Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about that. Absolutely. And I, I'll tell you, like one silver lining out of the pandemic, I think, is a realization how much of an issue mental health is, whether it's patients or whether it's doctors and nurses and clinicians. And I think that the other silver lining out of the pandemic is that we can use digital to increase access to care. So in 2019, I remember speaking um, about mental health and saying that less than 50% of the states have 50% of the providers needed for mental health issues. And now mental health is even a bigger issue. So we know our mental health providers are getting burnt out as well. So the good news is that there's lots of platforms, whether that is you know um, a digital um, app that you can actually you, uh, use for your own um, you know anxiety or stress, uh, where you have a chatbot chatbot that is uh, tied to an algorithm and artificial intelligence that can help you, or it's you know um, increased education around it, destigmatization, de destigmatizing it. Um, or if it's other therapies that are much more available, it, there is increased awareness and increased access to care. And that's what I'm really hopeful about. Perfect, uh, thank you so much. And I was actually wondering maybe, um, uh, Vinet, could you shed your light on how you see that, the, the stigmatization also, uh, but then in the with the students and from your point of perspective, uh, yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I do want to highlight that, uh, you know, mental health is, is so paramount. And again, this is an area where our students and residents are showing us that this is something we really need to, um, you know, invest in and be thoughtful about, um, you know, things that have happened just in our short time, you know, between my training and now, you know, we offer um, uh, mental health visits, you know, to opt out of, you know, when you start residency, just so you understand, here's the process, here's um, how to seek a counselor if you need it. Um, let's just destigmatize it. So this is just available for everyone. And it's just a mental check in, um, like going to the dentist, you know, uh, it's just taking care of your body, taking care of your mind. I think, you know, when we think about things like universal precautions, um, universal screening, those are the types of things that go a long way to destigmatizing um, illness. And so we have to do the same and also get out of our perfectionist silo, especially important in the pandemic. You know, some of our research has shown that doctors and especially doctors in training come to work sick uh, because they're too afraid to tell anybody that they're that they're not well um, and this you know could actually risk uh, contagion, for example, during the pandemic. So how do we just instu institute symptom check-ins and borrow from aviation and pilots where it's fitness for duty? Am I ready for work? And if I'm not, there are backup systems created so that um, I feel confident that I'm not, you know, overwhelming the system, but that I'm actually, the system is working for me and I can actually take the time that I need to recover. We're a long way from figuring out the system part, uh, but I do think we we are on the journey of destigmatization. Thank you. And I was actually wondering because um, now I'm going to make a little loop back to my history of um, performing in sports because that's how I always like try to compare it with, right? So in my sport, I did synchronized swimming, so I could uh, do a solo or I could be with a team. And if I compare this to the medical education, I start as being a solo, right? I start uh, educating myself and I need to actually compete with my peers to get into the specialty that I would like to get in. And the moment that you're there, you suddenly are a team and you need to work as a team. And I do think that there's also a sort of mindset switch, uh, which is, doesn't help whenever you uh, would experience some type of uh, burnout uh, com uh, complaints or other sickness, that is your mindset is that you want to continue and go on because if you don't, somebody else will. Uh, do you have something to, to comment on that or sh share your ideas? 
And Vinet, I was wondering if you would have some ideas on this. Sorry. I think, well, you know, I, I just was impressed with your uh, with your background uh, as a competitive, uh, you know, athlete. I, I, we have a funny joke here about how athletes do really well in medical school um, because it's uh, that team training, right? Team sports. Um, you're cultivating that the joy of sport cultivated with the um, high performance teams. Um, traditional, at least pre-med curricula, don't usually select for that type of experience. It's more of competition over collaboration. How do we flip it so we get collaboration over competition? That is something that I think could be um, something we work on in the sort of screening of applications, as well as honestly coaching people who are coming into our field. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And I think I see Russ, uh, Reese is also commenting and he says that alone we go fast, but together we go far and medicine is definitely a team sport and I cannot agree more. Thank you so much, uh, Russ, for uh, being here today with us as well and uh, commenting on us, uh, our panel discussion, very nice. Um, with that, I would like to go to our next question and that one is actually for uh, Dr. Jonathan. Um, with your background, I was wondering how can we improve health healthcare education globally uh, in Europe, but also in South America, for example. Thank you very much, Diana, for the question. So, first of all, when I when we started with this uh, panel, the first thing I saw was looking at the comments, and I saw people saying uh, "Good morning from Long Beach" and then "Late evening in Malaysia." Good morning from Buenos Aires, and um, we immediately realized that this is a panel that is being watched by a global community. And um, as a medical doctor that have been studying in one country in the Caribbean and then went to my home country, Peru, recertified over there and then traveled to Europe and had to recertify again, I, um, I get the, the very difficult, um, let's say, construction of healthcare if we talk about global healthcare. Uh, there's a lot of different connotations when we talk about education globally. Uh, there are social connotations, there are economic connotations, cultural connotations, um, and we have to be mindful with all those characteristics. Uh, that's really, really important. We have to uh, improve education by making it more accessible. There's a lot of countries uh, and a lot of places in which just education is not accessible. Uh, we have to make it affordable. We have to make it applicable. And when I say applicable, I mean um, applicable to the healthcare system or to the reality of the places where we actually deliver that medical education. Um, so that being said, I think that one of the most important things is, uh, especially for the, for the postgraduate education and uh, the doctors that have already left medical school, uh, we need to create initiatives of continuous medical education. I see many countries, especially if we're talking about digital health and technologies in, in, uh, in the medical practice, where we need to really put um, a lot of specifics and a lot of, uh, of of initiatives of education so that the doctors can actually not only adopt the technology but understand it realize what the potential is um yes there are many channels there's you have media channels you have social channels you have uh channels like medscape that are doing a tremendous job and um but it's really important that these doctors understand the necessity for instance, of technology and of digital health and learning these from these platforms so they can actually apply them in their countries and solve the access problem. Because if we think about how deep in, in issues are some countries in the Americas, for instance, in South America, we're talking about 1.4 doctors per thousand population in Peru, 1.1 doctors per thousand population in Colombia. These are really difficult numbers that, of course, make it completely um, ineffective, uh, the medical systems. And of course, it makes it very inaccessible for the majority of the population, especially the ones living in the rural areas, in the, in the really, really uh, poor areas of those countries. And applying digital health and applying technology will be the gap, uh, sorry, will be the bridge that will close this gap in the next years, but that can only be leveraged with the right adoption from the providers. And the only way that we can leverage that adoption is by creating really good and efficient educational initiatives. Thank you so much. And I was actually wondering, uh, Jonathan, what do you think if somebody would say that this uh, whole digital health uh, transformation that we are living right now will actually increase the gap? Um, and, and because you already said that we need to close that gap, uh, I think that we are at the point that it can actually increase the gap if we don't do it correctly. Can you? Tell us a little bit more about you, what you think about that. 
I think there's a lot of people that think that um, because they don't really see the feasibility of the technology being applied in their countries. Um, they see the, the difficulties regarding the regulatory field uh, landscape in their countries or just they see that the countries are really poor in connectivity and they think, well, you know, this is actually going to make it more for the... Um, for the higher classes, they're going to make it even more inaccessible than it was before. Um, so there are, of course, um, there have to be initiatives that come from the from the, um, the political structure, the official structure of the country, uh, leveraging the right uh, ecosystem for these digital uh, solutions to be implemented. Let's talking about uh, mobile connectivity, talking about a regulatory landscape that uh, that really applies to these technologies. Uh, of course, implementing it in the national systems, uh, you know, educating patients, educating doctors. But if we do things correctly. Uh, think about how difficult it would be for Brazil to implement physical infrastructure in all their provinces and the rural areas of that country compared to what they could achieve in a very small, uh, smaller period of time with digital technologies. Um, thinking about prevention, you know, thinking about the most difficult uh, topics and, and, and problems in, in public health that these countries have. Uh, mother fetal mortality, uh, infectious diseases, um, you know, so these can be addressed, they can be prevented, they can be monitored if we use the right digital tools from distance. That is very interesting. And I think that it means that we need to create this network to, to do this globally. Uh, if I understand you correctly. Um, and um, I wanted to also ask uh, Dr. Raphael about the virt virtual and augmented reality and um, if it can make a difference, it can make a difference in so many aspects of healthcare. Uh, and how can we incorporate this in educations for our uh, clinicians? Yes, thank you, Dana. It, it, definitely a, a mixed reality or, or XR, right, which is virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, and always haptics tied to it, it have, can have a tremendous impact. It's already having a tremendous impact in many schools, medical schools around the world, and in the U.S., of course, and training programs in surgery is being used as not a supplement, no, not, a, not a substitution, but a complement to traditional education. And uh, I think that uh, all these devices from, from, you know, from an early Google Glass to, uh, to a Magic Leap device, all they uh, have a, a, a potential to improve how we connect and communicate amongst ourselves and with knowledge. Uh, I, I see what, uh, what Jonathan was saying, uh, answering the question about the digital divide. I think that if we apply the technology, uh, again, in a, in a smart way, uh, we can really uh, have tremendous impact on how people uh, get educated. And when we say education, it's not just about students or, provi or, or, or young providers, it's about patients and relatives of patients. Platforms like uh, a surgical theater, where you, you, you put a a, a, a headset and then you can see you can watch your anatomy and you can see exactly what the doctor is going to do to you so what better way to understand uh, the procedure that you're going to undergo to give informed consent than to actually live the procedure in a way in in, in virtual reality in a in a fantastic voyage of, of sort so i think that that's 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 a reality and we're barely touching the the surface i think we're very tip of the iceberg uh, situation uh, right now. And uh, I think that if we think about uh, uh, 5G and 6G and 6 Wi-Fi and things that are going to interconnect the world, the, that digital divide that people fear is really not going to exist. We know that there are more uh, smartphones in the world than uh, there are people. And we know that places that don't have water or even electricity or even toilets or toothbrushes, they have a smartphone. And uh, you see pictures in uh, failed countries like, uh, let's say, Afghanistan or Venezuela, and people is connecting, you know, via satellite or via cellular networks with the rest of the world. So the potential to use this uh, as a learning and teaching tool is, is just immense, but it does require a, a reshaping, a complete reshaping of the medical curricula. Because if we don't do that, we're going to keep producing the same type of doctors for the 20th century, now today in the 21st century. And, uh, you know, people at uh, great academic institutions like the University of Chicago and the University of Vermont and many others, we need to work on reforming the curriculum and adapting the curriculum to the new technologies that are available out there. 
to teach and to learn. Wow, thank you so much. Um, so I think what we talked about today, because we're already hitting the hour, um, is about the, the innovation in medical education. We talked about much about uh, leadership in that. And I think this is also what Dr. Rafael is talking about right now, is that uh, with the leadership, we can actually, um, um, with the right leadership, we can implement it and the digital therapies or the digital um, um, transformation that we're living right now, uh, we can use it for our best uh, best practice instead of it being a burden. And we've also spoke a lot about uh, the burden for the doctors, but also all the other healthcare workers, uh, also the students that they are living it in this, uh, this time. Um, with that uh, in mind, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Jonathan, because I know that you guys are also having a, a clubhouse uh, panel discussion uh, can you tell us a little bit about that discussion? Yes. So uh, Dr. Hansa and I, we have been working intensively to uh, to create another space, you know, because we were just talking about it. You know, there has to be more and more spaces for education. And this space will be in a collaborative social media called Clubhouse in which um, we can actually have direct contact with our audience. Um, so they can actually ask us questions. We can go deep into conversations. We can invite speakers um, and, um, and we can deliver and leverage that education that is so needed. Um, this is a, a program that we in Medscape, we are going to be implementing very soon. And uh, we're going to be having a, a clubhouse first session next month. And um, I would like Dr. Hansa to continue to, uh, to present the rest of, the, of our plan. Uh, Dr. Hansa, you're still muted. Yes. Apologies. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we are very excited to put this event on uh, next month and would love for you all to follow us there and be a part of the conversation. We'll be talking about some of the issues here and some new ones, but certainly innovation education is at the forefront. So thank you so much. And thank you for attending today. Uh, I'm, I'm personally honored to be with this amazing group of experts and uh, also Thank you for all the questions as well, Diane. I'm going to pass it back to you. Thank you so much. I think uh, this discussion was amazing. And I think we also had a lot of interaction from the people viewing. And I want to thank all the viewers for asking the questions or giving their comments. Uh, it was very nice to hear from you and hear your perspectives and the questions. Um, and I'm even more excited to go for to the next discussion that we're going to be having. Uh, and as Jonathan said, the Clubhouse discussion is uh, for you. Download the app and then you can find uh, the Medscape uh, Clubhouse uh, Club uh, in which you're, you are going to be able to be part of the discussion. And there you can actually raise your hand and speak with us and, and, and join this discussion. Um, I am very grateful for all the panelists to take their time today to speak with us about the innovation in, in medical education. Uh, I love your perspective and I think this is an uh, ongoing uh, talk that we need to keep continuing and that's actually what we uh, we heard today um, so thank you all for uh, for your time for your attention and I would love to see you all soon again thank you Anna. thank you all a pleasure honor to be here thank you for having us thank you very Likewise. much thank you all so much bye thank you